Hey everyone, George Christie here with Wine Industry Network. Welcome to another edition of the Wind Educational Webinar Series. Today's webinar is titled, Simplify the Use of Active Dry Yeast in Wineries with Direct Inoculation. And it's sponsored by Fermentis. Our presenter today is Ann Flesh. Ann is the Technical Sales Support Manager for the Americas with Fermentis. And uh, she's gonna present some really great research that they've done in, on some of the products that they have to offer. And I think you're gonna find it really interesting. Now, as is always the case, we pre-record this a couple of days in advance. And the primary reason we do that is because we want to create as, as, as interactive an atmosphere as possible. So literally, while you're watching Anne present uh, the research, you're going to be able to ask her questions directly via the chat feature. And she's going to take those questions on as they come in. She's watching the broadcast live just like you are. So take advantage of that. Submit those questions. That's really our goal to make sure that these sessions are as interactive as possible. So I think that about covers it. I want to thank Fermentis again for their support. Without support like that, we wouldn't be able to offer these educational webinars for free the way that we do. Obviously, I want to thank you all for taking the time to be with us today. I think you're going to really enjoy the uh, presentation. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Anne to the stage and let her take it from here. Anne, take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, George, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Anne Flesch with Fermentis. Very happy to be here with you today and talk about yeast and fermentation. Um, so we're going to talk today about simplifying the use of active dry yeast uh, in wineries with direct inoculation, but also with more simple rehydration. So we'll talk a little bit about um, different types of process that you could do to simplify harvest. Um, so again, um, I am Anne Flesch. I'm, I'm the technical sales support manager for the Americas for Fermentis. Um, and um, let's move forward and, uh, and start with the presentation. All right, so for those of you who don't know who Fermentis is and we are, just wanted to quickly introduce uh, the company. Uh, Fermentis is a business unit of a large company called Losaf. Losaf is one of the key international players in fermentation. So we um, were a French-based company, but we have production sites and um, R&D centers all around the world, especially applied science centers. Uh, we do have production facilities in, in North America. Uh, that being said, most of the yeast that you are using as winemakers um, that we, uh, we distribute on a, a North American market usually come from Europe and are imported. Um, we, so Fermentis is the business unit uh, for the sub dedicated to beverage fermentation, which means that we have a uh, fermentation solution for winemakers, brewers, spirits producers, cider makers, and so on. And specifically for winemakers, we have a portfolio of product that is based obviously on um, yeast, but also yeast derivatives under the form of um, nutrients or fermentation aids. Um, ATP Group uh, is our uh, distributor uh, for our wine portfolio in North America. So they, um, they also have a full uh, catalog of energetical products, equipments, and so on. So uh, if you are ever interested in um, looking up for our products, this is where to go. And But they also have some sub-distributors. So quickly, for Mentis, like I said, for winemakers, we have um, a, a whole portfolio distributed by ATP Group uh, based on two categories of product, yeast, under the form of active dry yeast. Um, obviously to ferment efficiently in various condition um, and reveal very specific flavors and aromas in wine. And then we have yeast derivative, either uh, in a purpose of fermentation aids, so to increase fermentation performance or um, functional products. Um, there are a really yeast derivative dedicated to enhance, preserve the quality of your beverage. Um, we, uh, we're gonna talk today about active dry yeast, uh, more specifically, uh, but uh, we have plenty of webinars and things like that concerning our yeast derivative. And most specifically, we're going to talk about our easy to use E2U certification on active dry yeast. Um, and I'll go in details um, about this certification in a few slides. 
So today's agenda is really guiding you towards simplifying the use of yeast. Um, so we're going to go through kind of uh, the whole story about how is yeast Im implemented in wineries today. Um, then I'll explain to you what are easy to use E2U yeast. Um, we'll talk about uh, what are the advantages and benefits of using easy to use yeast. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about our production um, know-how and expertise behind the certification and what we do to validate our yeast uh, as E2U. Um, finally, um, uh, the three points are a little bit more practical. So point number six should be very interesting. It's really how to implement E2U at your winery. And uh, finally, um, uh, we'll talk about a field trial that I wanted to really show you a very concrete example uh, done in the USA. And finally, I try to answer one of some of the most common questions that I hear about easy to use. So let's start with how is yeast used today in wineries? So just an overview picture. Uh, today, most yeast on the market um, come with a recommendation of what we call yeast rehydration and also acclimatization. Um, so the process looks like this. Usually you start with um, uh, sprinkling yeast, the right quantity of yeast in non-chlorine water at um, uh, a very short range of temperature between 35 to 38 uh, Celsius. Um, often uh, it comes with rec a recommendation to be used with different rehydration agent that could help with hydration. Uh, you wait for 15, 20 minutes, uh, you do a, a gentle homogenization, and then potentially you, you can pitch the yeast, or you can add uh, an extra phase, some, uh, some winemakers do it, some don't, uh, acclimatization, where you start adding some of the must into your um, your yeast culture. Um, you, you add half of the volume from the must, you wait five to 10 minutes, and um, you repeat the operation until you have less than 10 Celsius difference between your yeast pitch and your tank. Um, and then you transfer into a tank. So this whole process, obviously, uh, it's, uh, it requires a lot of, uh, of things from the winery. Uh, you need to train the cellar properly to do rehydration. It's very time consuming. So as you can see, if you follow the whole process, it could take between 20 to 45 minutes for one tank. Um, it is can, quite consuming of energy uh, and of water, and of course, of also chemicals um, and products, uh, chemicals to clean the material, sanitation. Um, also, you can come into water temperature issue, let's say water is too hot, too cold, um, and all of it, whether you know you forget to pitch your yeast because you're too busy doing something else or um, something goes wrong, overall, you can encounter mistakes and this could um, um, uh, come with loss viability of some of the yeast. Um, so why fermenters developed the easy to use certification? Well, some of the winemakers top concern, we, we were aware that the winemakers top concerns during harvest were really um, uh, quite, quite important. Uh, it's to simplify operation and work orders. So minimize uh, the difficulty of the orders that you have to give um, to your setter crew. Um, at the same time, shorten operations because time and, um, and uh, uh, workers uh, value is very limit, uh, is very, um, you have to value it at the most. Avoid sluggish fermentation, avoid stock ferment, but of course you also want to optimize aromas, color, mouthfeel, avoid off flavors. So you still want diversity uh, in the in the yeast and things like that that you want to want to use. And these are all reasons why uh, fermenters um, created this easy to use certification. So what is an easy to use yeast? Um, so E to you stands for easy to use. It is a certification on our SAF Uno active dry yeast. Um, I will re refer as active dry yeast as ADY in the future, uh, maybe in this presentation. Um, so it allows a winemaker to really use our yeast in more flexible way. And I think the word flexible is very important. You don't have to direct pitch. Uh, you can still do a full acclimatization if you want. It just gives you more flexibility. 
Um, it is related to an expert active dry yeast production process uh, from Lesap and Fermentis, and it undergoes a strict validation process, and I will present um, uh, both um, in this presentation later. And what is what's important is that it covers um, most of the fermented saffronal strains and not only one or two, you still have a full diversity of choices out there. So I talked about flexible ways. What are these flexible ways? Well, you can choose what you wanna, want, what you wanna do. Um, if you are using an easy to use saffronal uh, active dry yeast, you can rehydrate but you also have more flexibility in the temperature of the water, which is quite important. Instead of just being at 37 Celsius, you can rehydrate in water through a wide range of temperatures, so 15 to 37 Celsius. Or, and you can still do an acclimatization, um, and it's optional. Or you can direct PJ yeast into the must, and that's really what most people find um, the most innovative, but really you have a wide range of solution that will help you overall make harvest easier. Um, I said it covers um, the whole of uh, our whole portfolio. So here I present in a few slides, what's our portfolio and what's the diversity of our yeast. And of course, if you have questions, feel free to reach out. Here you have an overview of our active dry yeast for winemakers. And you can see that we have some options uh, for red wines, for white and rosé. We really worked hard in, uh, uh, in the past few years. We have a lot of innovative product for white and rosé. And here you can see, for example, um, some, <laughs> some of our newest strains. Safano SH12 and PR106 are for thylic whites and rosé, such as Sauvignon Blanc or sparkling base wine. Um, and you can see that really most of our strain have this easy to use certification, um, but two uh, that are kind of um, older strain in our portfolio. What's interesting also to know is that a strain is not easy to use certified because it is a resistant strain, because it is, a, a, you know, what we call a workhorse yeast. It is easy to use because of the way, uh, the quality of the production of the active dry yeast and the, the quality of the product. And you can see here, um, this is a technical table that kind of displays a technical characteristic of, our, of, of the strains from Fermentis. And you can see, on the left, the fermentation kinetics going from slower strains to very fast strain, and the resistance to difficult conditions. Uh, difficult conditions could be um, could be temperature, nutrient level of alcohol, and so on. And you can see from moderate to strong resistance. And you can see that um, almost all the strains here have the certification. The reason why these two strains don't is not really because, uh, because they can't, it's just we haven't gotten to the whole process of certification. Um, but so it's important to understand that it's not only this strain that can be direct pitch because, because they can handle anything. It's really the quality of the dry product. All right, and I also said you don't have to sacrifice on, uh, on the aromatic and, for example, mouthfeel profile that you want to give to your wine because uh, we have a wide diversity of products. So here we have a table that is uh, our make you choice uh, table for white and rosé. And you can see that 10 out of these 11 strains are easy to use. And um, here we present to, uh, to you kind of, uh, it's a table that uh, guides you toward choosing the right strain for what you are trying to achieve in a white wine and rosé. And you can see you have different axes here. At the bottom, horizontally, you have how much the yeast strain is going to improve the roundness and mouthfeel in your wine. Then here uh, on this axis, you have how much the yeast is going to promote varietal aromas, such as thiols or terpenes or C13 or isoprenoid. And these precursors that you have in very specific grapes, um, and you can see, for example, the higher you go here, the more this strain will act on specific precursors. So for example, for SH12, it's gonna be thiol. So it's very, uh, you know, a great strain uh, to use if you're trying to produce Sauvignon Blanc or Colombao and things like that. HGT18, T stands for terpenes. Um, so it really promotes terpenes in wine. Uh, it could be, Riesling, Pinot Gris, uh, Muscat, and so on. So uh, 
the more uh, varietal aromas you want, the more and you want to promote them, the higher you want to go in this table. And so, for example, we also have the type of esters that our strain produce. Um, if it's A, it's going to be a very strong, intense amylic profile, very strong fruitiness. And if it's F, it's going to be more toward uh, ethyl esters, a complex fruitiness, more, uh, more delicate and elegant, a little bit less intense. But really, you have choice in our portfolio, and we're happy to, to guide you towards the best option for your wine. Same thing for the red strains, really. These are the strains that we recommend for red. Uh, you have different axes. Again, here, how much the yeast is going to improve the roundness, the muffler perception uh, of the wine. Um, horizontally, you have how much the yeast is going to improve the structure, not only the color, but also the tannin profile of your wine. And you also have on this axis uh, the type of uh, uh, fruity profile that you can explain for, from this strain, whether it is fresh red fruit aroma, such as strawberry, or might be ripe, more jammed uh, type of aromas um, uh, higher up here. So for example, if you're looking for a yeast that is really going to improve your, your tannic profile and color, uh, HDS 62 is a good option. Uh, it's going to have a low roundness. It's more for long aging uh, wines or, or wines that are really lacking uh, structure. Or for example, HDS 135, this one also improving structure, but bringing a nice roundness or maybe a quicker release to market type of wine for example. So these uh, seven of these trains are easy to use, I guess. So, so what are the different advantages of benefit of uh, easy to use yeast? And um, well, there are multiple, obviously, some are obvious. Um, if you choose to direct pitch or simplify rehydration, you're going to save time and you're going to gain comfort. Um, so workers overall are going to gain comfort and safety. They have uh, less inhalation of products overall, uh, but also uh, just carrying less uh, liquid uh, and all of these things make uh, make for easier the winery. You reduce humans' mistakes. You won't forget, you know, yeast preparation in a corner anymore. Um, you are making obviously saving, uh, economical saving on labor, on different type of products, hydration product, equipment, rehydration equipment, um, and so and, and chemicals and things like that. Um, on, a, on a sense, you are acting green by reducing all this input of energy, time, water, uh, and different products. And you are not doing it uh, without, you're not compromising on the quality of the wine. And I have some trials to show that you're not compromising either the fermentation kinetics or performances. Um, and you're not compromising on the diversity of the yeast trees that you have or on the quality of the final wine that you're making. So here are some key figures uh, that we evaluated. If 75% um, of the, uh, if all yeast users that we estimated, 75% of the winemakers uh, decided to not graduate the yeast, uh, these are some of the numbers of things that, you know, the world could save. Uh, it's approximately uh, 600,000 hectoliters of water per year worldwide. Uh, one point, uh, uh, 500 tons of detergent, uh, obviously CO2 emissions and things like that. So definitely some big savings on, uh, on the whole picture. Um, okay, so we talked about the advantages now. I want to just to, I think it's important for you to understand how we produce active dry yeast, know where your product comes from, um, and really what makes, what makes our yeast really high quality, easy to use. Um, so this is an overview of our production process. Uh, and it shows kind of the two uh, key phases that are the multiplication and the drying. But let's uh, let's go through the whole um, the whole process. The first thing is the production plan receives uh, some slant of the yeast from our R and D industrial. Um, the division as a slant arise and it is first grown in very sterile anaerobic environment going from really a few grams to a few hundred grams uh, in different batches. At this point, uh, we are really concerned about purity and sterility of the media. And then we move to the more industrial multiplication where um, 
in a few processes, we go to a few tons of yeast for each batch. Uh, this is done in a fed batch process where we continuously feed the yeast with sugar, uh, oxygen, nutrients, different vitamins. Uh, really, each strain is going to have its own recipe. And uh, eventually, um, once we arrive to uh, the right uh, the, the right the, the right quantity of biomass, uh, the first step is to start separating the water from the yeast. So it goes through first a centrifugation. Uh, then you can have the yeast cream that you can store at four Celsius, and eventually it goes through a different process to dry the yeast. First, the vacuum filter, an extruder. And then the key, really, the, uh, one of the key processes is really the drying done on a fertilized bed here. Um, and we arrive to the active dry yeast that you can, for example, buy in a 500 gram bricks. Um, so what, what are the different know-hows in this process? First of all, the multiplication, the industrial uh, multiplication. Um, so in this process, the yeast goes through asexual reproduction through budding from different budding cycles. Um, so as you know, the yeast is going to replicate its genetic material to give a daughter cell um, and eventually so um, uh, separate and gives two different cells. And uh, go, and the two cells can again go through the same cycle. Uh, so, what's what's important here are different things. First, we are really optimizing the process and the nutrients for um, when we stop the multiplication for uh, most of the yeast cell to be here at that stage of the process. At that stage, the yeast is in a growing phase. It is not in a process of uh, budding, so it really uh, it's the optimal membrane shape integrity because when you dry an active base, that is a process of budding here. This is really uh, uh, could create problem when you dry the yeast. So we are fixing the yeast in its best physiological state for direct fermentation. Um, also because when the yeast is growing, obviously it has on its membrane a lot of sugar transporters. Uh, so really for you as a winemaker, when you use a, a yeast that was dried in that state, uh, it is uh, directly operational for you to use uh, during fermentation. Um, we are also optimizing the amount of sterols, uh, glycerol, glycogen, threalos that are really all different um, molecules that are helping uh, with membrane fluidity, uh, but also membrane protection during drying and rehydration. And finally, uh, when we're done with the multiplication, we're adding um, what we call the, um, an emulsifier that is vegetable based uh, to the yeast cream. And that's, that's going to coat the yeast and really help them in the drying process. So now let's move to the drying know-how. Um, so like I said, we optimize the condition for the yeast to resist the drying. That is a quite um, uh, tough process on the yeast. Uh, and that's where you have to be very gentle. So um, we are optimizing, for example, uh, the threados and emulsifier content uh, that are really helping with the retention of the shape of the membrane during drying. And then uh, once you're done drying, you really have a nice retention of the shape of the membrane versus without these components, uh, you can have damages to the membrane. We are also adopting uh, technologies that are um, giving us the ability to have the most gentle drying. Um, and um, so really the fluidized bed, the air is coming from the bottom of the tank and the yeast is gently drying uh, at a certain time, for a certain temperature, it depends on the yeast strain, um, for really the, the uh, yeast to fold uh, very gently. And so to avoid pretty much the production of uh, these endovesicles here, uh, if you dry too quickly or too high temperature, uh, you can end up with these vesicles and a yeast strain that dries in that state might not be viable when you rehydrate it. So finally, um, the drying know-how allows to go from a full size membrane to really an optimal folding, like I said, with um, a good viability and resistance to rehydration. Eventually, each strain has its own recipe in multiplication and drying, and you end up after drying with 
really uh, 94 to 96.5 dry matter. And, um, and this is what it looks like under the microscope. All right, so this was a little bit about how we produce yeast and high quality active dry yeast. Um, how about the fermentist validation process for the easy to use certification? So before we guarantee that you can uh, use our yeast in a flexible way, we do what we call um, a two-step validation process. And this validation process um, uh, has objective to show three things. It, has to show that the yeast is going to have a high preserve viability in all rehydration conditions that you choose, uh, whether it is rehydration in water, direct pitching. Um, that, however, the way you choose to use the yeast is going to maintain its fermentation performances. So, similar lag phase, kinetics, and the fermentation, uh, analytical of the must uh, and of the, of the resulting wine, sorry. And finally, uh, that's the most important really, is that in terms of sensory, you're going to have wines of equivalent quality, however you chose to use your yeast. So if this happens, uh, if the three things are really maintained, we can officially declare our yeast easy to use. So we do this in two different steps. The first one is a test of viability after rehydration in different conditions. Um, and this is done in laboratory in pure water or in water with different concentration of sugars, and then look at the resulting uh, viability. And then the two second points are done through um, one or several micro vinification, um, where we are doing different scenarios of, um, of uh, inoculation. One where we really do the, what we call the usual way with a rehydration and acclimatization. Second one, we do a rehydration in cold water at 15 Celsius. And the last one, what we call must, is pretty much direct picturing. So I, uh, I have a, an example to show you today. These are trials for the certification of um, the Stafano HTS-135 that has been a very uh, popular choice uh, in, in North America for uh, red wine, giving a really nice structure, nice color, but also smooth finish uh, on many, many different uh, types of red wine. Um, here you have uh, the laboratory scale that I mentioned. So you have, uh, we did rehydration of the yeast in different, um, different temperature of uh, water from 10 Celsius to 43 on the right. Um, and we also did um, uh, here in here, uh, different concentration of sugar, mimic mimicking the concentration of sugar in the mast. And we looked at the residual uh, viability after rehydration. And you can see that, first of all, each strain is going to have its own viability. This is a, a very good viability uh, between 18.5 and 89. Um, so uh, very good for this, this strain. Uh, and you can see that there is no significant difference in the resulting viability, whether you choose to rehydrate at 10 Celsius, which is tap water, or 43 Celsius, and if there were sugar present. So really here we can say, however you choose, we can show that there is preserved viability for this strain. Um, and then here we are looking at micro uh, vinifications um, and at the fermentation performances. So we have these three different scenarios I mentioned, usual, yeast as usual, yeast rehydration in cold water and dark pitch into the must in green. And we look at the density and the temperature. This was done on a Malbec in Argentina. And you can see really the three scenarios have a similar lag phase, very similar kinetics. Maybe for one day, the usual scenario actually was a little bit slower, but eventually we can say that these three scenarios have similar fermentation performances. And finally, and, and like I said, always importantly, uh, we want to make, sh make sure that um, when you taste the wine, you cannot um, see significant difference between the wine that's going to be of equivalent quality and profile. And we usually do that by doing triangular tasting. Um, so we have these three scenarios, usual, cold, must, and we do triangular tasting with professional panels. And we are assessing whether or not the panel can find significant difference between the wine. And we are um, 
here in that, that case, NS means non-significant difference uh, in comparing the usual versus the cold, the usual versus directly in the mast, or the cold versus directly in the mast. And so in that case, we can say really these three wines have um, organic profile of equivalent quality. So for each strain, we do that on different types of wine before certifying the yeast easy to use. This is just another example, just to show you that we, uh, for strains like BCS 103 that are very strain that we recommend on all types of wine, we do it on a diversity of wines. Uh, we did it on the Grenache, at 20 to 28 Celsius fermentation temperature and a clairette on uh, 17 Celsius. And you can see that in all cases, you have usual cold must, again, same, uh, same modalities. Um, here you have for, um, for the clairette and here you have for the Grenache. And you can see that really the kinetics are very, very similar. So, now let's talk about implementation and what are the different ways you can um, use, um, simplify the use of yeast with easy to use at your winery. Um, so we are back to this slide. I said you could do it in a flexible way. Rehydrate, rehydrate in water between 15 and 37. You can add an acclimatization or you can go and do some direct pitching. And I have many here recommendations for direct pitching. So, First slide here is for red wine process. You can introduce the active dry yeast directly at different stages. Um, the, most, uh, the most common here is going to be, and you have the red wine making process, very simplified. The most common option would be option three, where you pour directly the active dry yeast, the right quantity, uh, directly into the fermentation vessel once your tank is full. And what's important is to do a nice homogenization really quickly. Um, alternatively, you can also take a little bit of juice, put the yeast in, do a nice uh, gentle homogenization and pour it immediately on the mast and homogenize. That's another option. Um, some other options, another option that is possible that um, a lot of wineries have really liked doing it that way is to introduce the active dry yeast directly to the juice post this demo crusher before the pump before the pumping into the tank that's another option you can also do the same thing actually um, uh, gently mix the uh, uh, gently sprinkle the active dry yeast in the um, same time its weight of juice and directly pour it that's another way of doing it and finally another option is to uh, spray the active dry yeast that is a yeast in water suspension immediately on the grape homogeneously at reception. Um, this, is, this will and could provide some bioprotection benefits to you, uh, colonizing very quickly with a Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the microbiome. Uh, you have to be very careful when you do this with a Saccharomyces cerevisiae. First of all, you need to choose your yeast very um, wisely, and I have a recommendation in the next slide. But also you need to make sure that if you do that, you are really maintaining your fruit in your process at very low temperature for the fermentation um, to not start uh, early. Um, so some do and don'ts here for red wine. Something very important to remember, however you decide to do direct pitching, you always wanna sprinkle the yeast in a liquid phase, not on a dry fruit that's going to create a crust and being exposed to oxygen. This is not, this is, not, um, uh, this is the definitely not recommended. Another recommendation that could, you could apply to any different uh, times you introduce it is that you always want to ensure a very good diffusion of the yeast very rapidly to the entire volume. That's really going to help um, help the, the fermentation overall. So it could be with a bumping over, for example. Um, if you choose to introduce the yeast in the pre-fermentation stage for bioprotection or um, to ease your process, uh, recommendation are really select the yeast strain that has a long black face, slow kinetics that you can control with temperature. Consider, of course, also a low active dry yeast dosage at that stage that you can complete later in the fermentation tank. Um, you can 
uh, really the key point is maintaining a very low temperature to pre, um, in pre-fermentation stages to avoid fermentation to start. And if you introduce the yeast, let's say in option one or option two, you really want to refrigerate your fermentation tank early because uh, the fermentation most likely will start very quickly and you could have detrimental heat peak um, if you are not careful with temperature management. That could hurt your fermentation. Um, some don't. Uh, you don't want to do um, option one uh, specifically with any Saccharomyces cerevisiae strain in pre-fermentation stage. You want to choose your strain wisely. Um, also, you don't want to add yeast in pre-fermentation stage without control of the process, like I said. And uh, just also like in any yeast addition, you want to make sure that you don't pour the yeast directly on other types of addition, like uh, uh, different type of acid, uh, KMDS and things like that. All right, so for white wine and rosé, uh, we also have different options here for you. The most common one would be um, option three where um, you start moving your juice from, um, from the settling tank to the fermentation tank. Uh, you, start, um, you, you start transferring, then you gently sprinkle the yeast on top and you keep filling for a good homogenization. Alternatively, you can do it at the end and do an homogenization then. Uh, barrel, uh, uh, Direct pitching in barrel is also, of course, an option. Again, you have the option to take a little bit of the juice um, and to uh, gently, uh, gently homogenize the yeast in there and direct pitch. That's another option. You could also um, have other options that could bring you some bioprotection benefits. Um, it could be, for example, to pour the active dry yeast directly into the, the master juice after pressing or potentially um, uh, crushing. Um, and you could also spray the yeast again that is in a water suspension on the grapes homogeneously as at reception. Uh, I would recommend option one and option two only, uh, first of all, if you have a good temperature control. Again, you don't want fermentation to start. And if you are doing a gentle clarification. Uh, something, of course, to consider is that if you have start of fermentation, it's definitely going to affect settling and clarification. So uh, these uh, have to be done in a very, very um, careful way. Um, some do and some don'ts. We have some same recommendations and for the red wine, but um, it's uh, especially true that you want to homogenize the yeast to the entire volume very quickly, especially when you are at low temperature in a tank, because uh, really the low temperature physically delays the homogenization of your tank. So if you can help with a good homogenization at the beginning, it really helps. Um, again, uh, if you are choosing a yeast for a bioprotection, you really want to select the right yeast for you. We do have recommendation for you. Uh, a yeast that has long black face, low kinetics, that you're really going to be able to control so that the fermentation doesn't start, that only the yeast really colonize the, the, the media, but the fermentation doesn't start, and have really good control on the temperature. Um, the recommendation here are the same as for red. I don't want to repeat myself. I also want to say it's very important to not do a half rehydration and a half direct pitching. You want to do, if you do rehydration, do a rehydration in water for at least 15 minutes. If you do a direct pitching, do a direct pitching. We've seen some cases, and that takes me to the next, uh, the next uh, slide. Um, if you choose to do rehydration, we have seen cases where here you can see we have um, a case study. Uh, it's on Chardonnay with uh, our strain Safano GBS 107, where we did not only rehydration directly in a must in orange, as, as usual with uh, acclimatization, but also cold one and cold two. So cold one is rehydration in tap water at 15 Celsius for 15 minutes, but cold two is rehydration in tap water at 15 minutes only for one minute. And you can see that the cold two actually uh, struggled a little bit that the rehydration wasn't uh, given enough time in water to, um, it was a shock back to back on the yeast. Uh, so really, this is uh, the recommendation. Either you choose a rehydration and you really do it for at least 15 minutes or you don't, um, uh, but that's that's pretty much it. So if you, if you do choose to rehydrate, the our recommendations are the same than, than in the past. 
for the yeast uh, on 10 times its weight of tap water, 15 to 37 Celsius. It's really the flexible way with our strain. Gently steer to avoid the clumps. Wait for 20 minutes and then transfer into the tank or do an acclimatization uh, is possible. So uh, field trial, I wanted to display a field trial to you. Uh, this trial here was done um, with the Hess Monterey Chardonnay um, and the protocol was um, uh, 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 Chardonnay juice. It was really homogeneous between two similar tanks uh, in order to really have identical initial condition. The wine number one was uh, the yeast was radiated uh, with regular radiation with, um, without acclimatization. Um, and then wine number two was GVS 107 direct pitch into the tank during tank filling. Um, all addition and other operation were really identical between the two tanks. Uh, the yen was adjusting to 250 ppm, fermentation temperature around 56 Fahrenheit and no malolactic fermentation. We collected data in each tank, of course, initial final chemistry and daily breaks and temp. We also did implantation test, uh, yeast implantation test at two thirds of the fermentation to really assess what yeast, um, what was the yeast population at that time. Um, and uh, we also submitted the two resulting wine to a triangular tasting with a professional panel. Uh, and we analyzed the aromatic compounds uh, in both wines. So here you can see the kinetics. In blue, you have the temperature of the easy to use scenario or the uh, or the normal rehydration, we call it normally here. Uh, and in yellow, in orange, um, the two shades of orange you have uh, the density. Uh, in dark orange of the easy to use uh, direct pitching and in light orange of the normal rehydration. Um, so you can see the lag phase were very similar. It seemed like the normal rehydration started slightly earlier, but eventually they had the same rate of fermentation and finished within uh, half a day of each other. Um, uh, so very nice. And this could be considered really as similar kinetics. Um, so then here you can see we analyzed the... Um, the mass, the juice, and post-fermentation too. And I don't want to go into details, but really it's important to see uh, these are wines with very, very similar um, similar profile. And uh, uh, really we could assess between these two scenarios, uh, the fermentation performances were very, very similar. In terms of SO2 production, pH, uh, volatile acidity, and so on. And finally, like I said, we did implantation test uh, in both tanks, whether it was direct pitch, and it was a quite low temp, uh, medium low temperature, or, um, or rehydrated. Uh, the, both tanks were dominated by one single strain, that was the, the GVS-107. Um, there was a very an absence of other yeast strain uh, showing that uh, in both cases, there was a very competitive strain. Um, and concerning the result of the panel and the uh, aromatic compound analysis, the professional panel judged the two wines as non-significantly different with a triangular tasting. And that panel was made out of uh, eight uh, professional uh, tasters. Um, and the analysis of the aromatic compound did show uh, uh, showed no, non-significant difference for um, uh, for uh, 10 out of 12 compounds that were analyzed. Uh, two showed some significant difference. It was a 2-phenyl ethanol acetate and beta uh, damascemon that was positively toward the easy to use. That being said, uh, in terms of uh, sensory, the panel couldn't taste the difference between the two wines. Um, so that was that was just a practical case done in the USA um, on um, a quite large scale. All right, and this takes us to uh, the most common questions um, that I will try to answer. These are questions that I hear uh, from winemakers that come to the to, to see me uh, at different trade shows at the booth or when I come visit different winemakers. And so I thought, you know, let's try to put them together and answer them. 
Um, so some uh, some questions, for example, do I need to increase the inoculation rate when I direct pitch? Um, so some people are under the impression that um, they need to compensate with a higher pitching rate because there will be a loss of viability because they direct pitch. Um, this is not the case. Uh, uh, if that was the case, uh, we couldn't really certify that um, direct pitching doesn't affect. Uh, no, for sure, if you direct pitch, the idea is that you you use the same inoculation rate. We recommend uh, around 20 gram per hectoliter for um, for primary fermentation. Um, as a question, I usually use rehydration agent during rehydration. Will I see a negative impact of not using it? Um, so I, I showed you how we produce active dry yeast. At Fermentis, our active dry yeast comes very rich in survival factor, um, and the membrane uh, comes very resistant uh, to rehydration. So you will not see negative impact of not using rehydration agent on the rehydration process. Um, that being said, if you are really pushing a yeast strain in high gravity, uh, in, 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 in uh, high, uh, high um, ethanol, uh, we always recommend uh, to uh, oxygenation of your must and also potentially at the end of fermentation, bring some uh, different fermentation aids such as yeast hulls that are going to be able to provide uh, additional survival factor for your um, for yeast to ferm to ferment efficiently uh, until the end. So it's not going to change anything to our uh, nutrient program that we recommend uh, the way you pitch your yeast. So and short answer, you will not see a negative impact of not using rehydration agent um, with our active dry yeast used as uh, direct pitch. Um, are there two different versions, one that is easy to use and not easy to use of our yeast? Um, no, there, there, is, there are not two different versions. It's the same yeast. You can choose to use it in a flexible way. So there is only uh, one version of our yeast and it's easy to use. Um, I think I, and the, I already answered the one about do I need more nutrient if I direct the yeast? No, you do not. Uh, our uh, uh, our nutrient and fermentation management protocol remains the same, uh, whatever way you decide to use the yeast. Um, and I add the yeast at the bottom of the tank and fill on it. Um, so definitely, that's something that I would definitely not recommend to do. When the yeast is in a dry stage, it is, um, uh, it is very susceptible to, to, to stress, to shear stress. So let's say you sprinkle yeast from uh, the man way directly into your tank at the bottom, that could really hurt um, the yeast when it falls on the stainless steel, uh, plus the, the must falling on it. Um, so I do not recommend to do that. You always wanna make sure that you sprinkle in a liquid phase, you start filling a tank and then you, and then you, you sprinkle the yeast on it. Um, for sure. Um, the, does easy to use mean I can use the yeast in any way I want? Uh, for example, shorten rehydration. Uh, it's, I think I also answered that, but um, it means you can use it in flexible way. We still have recommendation. You should uh, not do uh, half rehydration, half direct pitch, either choose rehydration or uh, choose direct pitching. Um, can I add the yeast at the crush pad distemmer in transport truck? Um, so I think I gave some recommendation for red. You can add the yeast post distemmer crusher. Make sure that you add it in liquid phase. Uh, it's been very successful for a lot of winemakers to do it that way. It seems like it gives you a good homogenization of the yeast very quickly and fermentation starts quite quickly too. If you want to use the yeast in transport, in juice, things like that, I've heard, I've definitely heard some winemakers doing it. If you are using it in order to do some bioprotection, it's definitely an option. Um, and I think I gave a lot of recommendation. You want to make sure that you are really choosing the yeast uh, wisely um, to work with your condition. You want to make sure that uh, you maintain low temperature, um, but it's, it's definitely a possibility. Um, how do I proceed with white wine and rosé at very low temperature from clarification? 
So you can direct pitch the yeast in uh, at low temperature, even if you haven't reached the fermentation temperature. Uh, you want to make sure that you help with homogenization. Uh, so it's always better if you do it while the, the juice is being transferred. Uh, but uh, as as um, until the tank reach a certain temperature, the yeast is just not going to be active. So uh, you're going to see a long lag phase until um, it's not even a lag phase until the yeast can actually be active. You can, um, uh, but it's not going to impact negatively the yeast. Uh, can I direct pitch or a restart of a secondary fermentation? So this is something that we do not recommend um, because when you have um, when you have a stuck ferment or when you have a secondary fermentation, you already have a very challenging environment for the yeast. Um, you are not pitching it in in juice with sugar. You're pitching it with uh, wine that already has a lot of ethanol or in uh, a stuck uh, ferment that has potentially alcohol, um, toxins, uh, maybe, you know, other yeast and bacteria could be um, the reason of the stuck ferment. And so in that case, really, we do recommend a full rehydration and potentially uh, acclimatization also. Um, and um, I think I have answered most of this question. How do I proceed with must undergoing um, cold maceration, low temperature vinoculation? I think I answered that. Um, you can use the yeast earlier on in pre-fermentation as long as you are really uh, making sure the fermentation doesn't start. Um, and these were some of the most asked questions that I received about um, direct teaching. Hopefully it was useful to you. Um, I welcome any questions. I uh, put my email address here. If you uh, if you had specific question and wanted to reach out, um, as it's a.flesh at fermentis.lesap.com. I really thank you for your attention. Hopefully this was useful and it gives you an idea on how to potentially save a lot of time during harvest uh, by simplifying operation. I think uh, simplifying, uh, reducing time, reducing cost, um, supply chain, and uh, uh, time management has been a, a big topic um, worldwide uh, in winemaking. So I hope uh, I hope it helps you find solution for you. Um, I also want to invite you next week. We're giving a presentation at Uno Forum. Um, and it's going to be actually about uh, using the easy to use certified active dry yeast for um, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae for bioprotection in white wine. So if you are interested, uh, please, please join. It should be complimentary about, um, with what I presented today. Thank you very much, everyone. And um, have a good, uh, a good year, a good harvest. And um, see you soon. <laughs>